Hi, do you work in a room without windows or know someone who does? While this arrangement can be good for concentration, the lack of sunlight makes it bad for, well, everything else. But if you were born sometime in the past 200 years, checking a clock without getting distracted is probably second nature to you. So what if your clock could not only t tell you the time, but tell you the time in a more solar way? A countdown, accurate to the minute, of each action in the sun's daily and yearly path, and do all this and more without the hassle of connecting to the internet. If this sounds interesting, watch this video to find out why it works, how it works, and how you can make such a device for yourself. But be well prepared, because this project leads down a fascinating rabbit hole of astronomy, timekeeping, history, folklore, and a whole lot more. All the source code and PCB design files can be found on GitHub. The links are in the description below. You can also use timestamps to skip between sections. But before moving on, a quick shout out to the sponsor of this project's PCBs, PCBWay. PCBWay offers custom PCB prototyping and assembly in addition to 3D printing and CNC services. Just upload your files and use a variety of materials and some seriously cool colors and they take care of everything else. They also have a pretty good Gerber file viewer which helped me a lot with this design. So thank you PCB Way for sending me these amazing PCBs. So how can a device tell where the sun is in the sky without any external communication and without actually looking out the window? It turns out this problem is actually a really old one. So old in fact that the oldest mechanical computer we know of, the Antikythera mechanism, was also built to solve pretty much the same problem. Like my own device, it did not and could not connect to the internet, but it still predicted astronomical positions and eclipses decades well in advance. It could use its mechanical gears to perform a series of mathematical calculations to tell you exactly what you needed to know, such as the date of the next lunar eclipse or when the next Olympic Games would start. The most rudimentary way of making such predictions was to simply observe and note down the positions of celestial bodies like the sun or other stars at fixed intervals of time. This is in fact how some of the earliest forms of astronomy were practiced, notably by the ancient Babylonians. They made extensive tables for celestial positions over long periods of time, and combined with some pretty sophisticated arithmetic, these allowed them to predict and then later confirm that some celestial phenomena are actually periodic in nature. For example, the appearance of Venus in the sky and the 18-year-long cycle of lunar eclipses. While Babylonian astronomy was concerned mostly with date and timekeeping, the idea of using mathematics and especially geometry to not only study but to also predict and explain the working of the cosmos would actually arise in ancient Greece. At first, they too were concerned with measurement problems like quantifying the length of a solar year and the variations in daylight over this year, as well as things like variations in shadow lengths over the course of a single day. But the questions that seem obvious and natural to us today weren't quite as obvious until someone in ancient Greece tried to explain the mysterious workings of certain unusual stars by using geometry, specifically using a set of inclined concentric spheres. You see, unlike the average star in our night sky that moves in a simple predictable arc, some deviant stars seem to stop moving and in fact travel backwards every now and then. Even though this solution turned out to be not quite accurate by today's standards, it was still one of the earliest demonstrations of the use of mathematical tools to solve specific astronomical problems. This set off a frenzy of more astronomy and more mathematics arguing about the correctness or incorrectness of such models, and if mathematical models could even be used to explain the working of the cosmos in the first place. But even if the more abstract questions weren't settled, and some still aren't, pretty much all the mathematics required for this project seems to have already been developed around this period. Thankfully nowadays there are so many great resources from where we can learn this math, such as this NOAA website that contains both example spreadsheets as well as this nice PDF that sums up all of this ancient knowledge along with some modern updates in a mere page and a half. But knowing the correct math is only one part of the project. The other part, that is actually knowing the correct time, is a problem that is far more complex and relies upon a piece of engineering that is surprisingly recent. While the history of timekeeping itself is older than written history, it seems that the history of precise timekeeping is astonishingly young, far younger than that of either astronomy or computing. It is a fascinating story that is well beyond the scope of this video, but for all people interested in the history of engineering, here is a brief explanation of the parts relevant to this project. 
Apparently the first person in the entire history of civilization to notice that pendulums could be used to keep track of time was Galileo, all the way into the late 1400s. He made a prototype before he died, but it would be roughly another 200 years until Christian Huygens invented the very first practical pendulum clock. As a result, people were now able to measure individual seconds for the very first time in human history. The pendulum clock was so radical that all practical timekeeping technology made since then still uses the very same principle of using harmonic oscillations to track the passage of time. At the heart of my project is a more modern kind of harmonic oscillator. It is a temperature-compensated crystal oscillator, which is exactly the same type of device that keeps track of time in digital watches and so many other electronics that we use. Typically, this version draws less than a microamp on standby, so I can keep a precise track of the time for a long um, time with just its regular coin cell. I then use an RP2040 microcontroller on the Pi Pico to read this time and knowing my location have it tell me exactly where the sun is in the sky at all times of the day and all days of the year. All information gets displayed in a visual manner since I have this entire 3.5 inch LCD module to work with. It has a resistive touch overlay so I can cycle through an array of different screens each with its own unique mix of information or use it to change settings on the fly or just set it to cycle screens automatically. For any of the screens, I can also see past times or future times. For most of the day, I like to have it display the screen that shows me two very important things that help me be more mindful of time. The first is a countdown to the next event in the sun's daily cycle. It shows me the name, the hours and minutes left, and the actual time of the event. It's especially nice in the winters to know exactly how much daylight is left. And in peak summer, it is very useful if I'm up really late at night but still want to be asleep at least a few hours before the break of dawn. The second important thing is the graphic at the top that shows me a real-time visualization of the altitude of the sun over the entire day, both above and below the horizon, which itself is marked by the thick white line, and by definition is at an altitude of 0 degrees. The fainter white line right below it marks minus 6 degrees, which is the accepted astronomical definition for civil twilight. So when the geometric center of the sun is between these two lines, that is the period we call twilight, and extending that logic, when it dips below minus 6 degrees, it is completely nighttime, and when it rises above 0 degrees, it is completely daytime. Overall, the point of the screen is to function as a kind of progress bar for the day that I can just glance at really quickly without having to get distracted from whatever I happen to be doing. It's the same principle as analog clocks, except traditional clock faces are of course agnostic to the seasons and the sun. But given the very same data, let's go one step deeper into the day. This is the very same diagram as the previous page, except for the few additions. The actual elevation angle and vertical lines intersecting the time axis at today's first light, sunrise, sunset, and last light. This naturally divides today into three parts, the length of which I can see right here. So today everyone living at the same latitude as me will receive 15 hours and 36 minutes of daylight, including the times of both uh, dawn and dusk. The percentage right above it shows me how much of the 15 hours and 36 minutes of daylight has already gone by and the percentage at the bottom shows me how much of the total day has gone by. Unless you're an astronomer, one of the things that really stands out from looking at this diagram is that the lengths of the first and third parts of the day are not exactly equal. Part of this is because of being in daylight saving time right now, but even without daylight time, the first and third parts of the day can be slightly different depending upon the exact time of year. For example, on February 12th, there is a 25 minute difference between the first and third parts of the day, and even if we cut from solar midnight instead of midnight, it is still about a 12 minute difference. Anyways, as we go through the seasons, the screen will serve as a nice visualization of how the proportion of daylight as well as the maximum altitude of the sun are changing. At my latitude, it is roughly about a five and a half hour difference between the longest and shortest days of the year, and roughly a 45 degree difference in the daily maximum altitude of the sun. These differences get more extreme the further away one lives from the equator. And finally, I can see the exact times for today's first light, sunrise, solar, noon, sunset, and then last light. But let's get another step deeper into today, because there actually happen to be three different types of twilight, the times of which can be seen quite nicely in this diagram, along with their actual duration as well. One major annoyance here is that when you google information about twilight, you'll be blasted with thousands of pages saying the same thing, which is how many degrees of altitude each twilight is defined by but almost no information on why we need these different twilights. So if you're like me and you're not satisfied by just the how and what questions, and need to know why things happen the way they happen, 
you're in luck because I found a wonderful article on Atlas Obscura, which covers the exact reasons for having different types of twilight. You can find the link in the description. But coming back to the diagram, it was interesting to find out that in addition to the actual proportion of daytime and nighttime, the lengths of the different twilights also changed noticeably throughout the seasons. There is a 20 minute difference in dusk and dawn each between the longest and shortest days of the year. The difference is more pronounced the further one lives away from the equator. So like me, if you've ever felt like it gets dark far too quickly in the window, now you know that's because it actually does a bit. The next screen shows me how the sun will appear physically from my point of view over the course of the day. I can compare it to the yearly highest and lowest angles for solar noon, which is 76 and 28 degrees for my latitude. It also shows me the minimum and maximum altitudes of the sun today, although the minimum altitude is below the horizon, so I can't exactly see it in this diagram. Uh, while the screen doesn't show me any fundamentally new information compared to the previous ones, I still really like the visualization, which by the way is my original artwork and kind of looks like Cyclops from X-Men. But moving on, if I really want to know exactly what the sun is doing outside, one more piece of information is needed, that is what direction the sun is currently in. In the horizontal coordinate system, this is called the azimuth. It is the same basic concept as compass bearings that tells you the angular distance from a known reference point, in this case true north. So at my specific location looking top down with north at the front, I know that the sun will rise and set on the horizon at these specific positions today. The grey labels along the perimeter mark the times of which the sun will be at those specific angles. The highest and lowest angles for sunrise and sunset over the entire year are also shown on the perimeter by the white markers. This way I can get a nice visual representation of the uh, relative orientations of sun and earth over the entire year. The sun icon of course marks which direction the sun can be found in at this specific moment. What's really interesting about the azimuth angles is that they're the reason the clockwise direction is actually clockwise. Because if you used a sundial in the northern hemisphere, this is the direction the shadow would rotate in over the course of any given day. This is a neat diagram, but I can make it even better by combining it with the previous one to show me both the altitude and the azimuth at the same time. 